Good morning, everyone. It's a great uh, privilege and honor for me to be here with you this morning. My name is Richard Preston. I am married and have three children. And um, for the last 30 odd years, have been living in a city called Port Elizabeth down in the Eastern Cape. And I do bring you greetings from the folk there. I haven't met all of you, but uh, I'm sure we'll do that over the tea break. We are looking at this morning a base church development, and the notes that I have are on page 200. The notes are exceptionally good. <laughs> they are excellent, in fact. If you, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them or work through them, but you will find that there's a study of five churches that qualify as base churches in the New Testament. You have an account of the church at Jerusalem, you have an account of the church at Antioch, Thessalonica, Corinth, Philippi, and Rome. And then towards the end, you have a compilation of all the characteristics of a base church, and there are 14 of them, and they start on page 202, 212. So the notes are comprehensive, and I would encourage you to work through them and to look at them, and we're going to look at a few of them briefly this morning. <coughs> to help us in understanding what a base church is, it's always a great idea to get a bird's eye view of where it fits in, in the pattern of authentic New Testament church life. Base church wasn't something that we were aware of in the early days of what God was doing with us as a as church movement, as a church flow. It was a concept that developed as we put into practice the visions and the values of of what Dudley began to um, open up to us through the New Testament. <clears throat> and a base church kind of grew larger and larger and larger in our understanding. And um, <clears throat> the importance of it became fundamental to how we build churches. And so if God has laid on your heart a mandate to build a church, then with that mandate, he'll give you a blueprint as well. So you already should, in the inner recesses of your spirit, have an understanding of what it is that God is calling you to build. Um, it's guys that have got that inner knowing of this is the path that God has called me to, these are the kind of people that God has called me to, this is how I'm to work this, his calling and his mandate out practically, that should be in an embryonic form in your hearts at the moment whilst we're sitting here. You should have an idea. And so over the years, uh, folk have come to me and to us in our corporateness and said, we have a desire to plant a church. This is the way we see it um, operating. And a lot of it has been presumption well, much of it has been presumption that just hasn't worked out in reality. I can remember one example where a young guy came to me and said, his church is going to be different. It's going to be built on signs, wonders, and miracles. So I said, good luck with that. And uh, that didn't work out really well because there weren't too many signs, wonders, and miracles to, to build on. And so we have to have an understanding of what it is that God has called us to, and fundamental to that is a base church. And one of the ceilings that um, Dudley broke for us was that he said a base church is not tied to its size. So you can have a base church of 10 people. And that's a kind of a liberating thing. So it's not when we grow up one day, we will be a base church. The idea is we start with the men mentality of a base church immediately from day one, and we'll look at what all of that means. 
And so we started speaking, we started using words to describe what God was doing with us in those early years. And one of the words was um, a beachhead. And I've got my notes that I dug up over many, many years. And this is a direct quote from um, Dudley Daniel. He said, we need thousands of base churches around the world. He said, let's establish beachheads from which we can plant dozens, if not thousands, of effective evangelists, church planters, and pastors. Let's model and flesh out what we believe, no matter what the cost. God calls. God commands. We do it. It's harvest time. Revival is in the air. There never has been a greater open door of opportunity. Let's seize it. We can. Those are some of the, there was a quote straight out of, um, <coughs> out of notes that uh, Dudley had uh, prepared and that I managed to dig up. And so we started as, as base churches began to be developed in our ranks. And as people got a vision and a dream to <coughs> take that which we'd received out into the, the, the world and out into those doors, through those doors of opportunity that opened we noticed a pattern developing in the way that we operated. And Ian McKellar was one of the first people that actually um, was able to identify the pattern and identify it with the New Testament. And we were living in the reality of this. And I'm just going to read a bit. He wrote an article in a Let's Talk magazine that we used to have operating a number of years ago. And this is what he wrote in this article. He said, Barnabas and Paul, together with the team, set up a base in Antioch that is training and releasing leaders. It is a church community of grace where people have been saved. Then they reached out from their base in Antioch and preached, teach, taught, and released elders in the surrounding provinces. Uh, planting new churches at Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Corinth. And so they set up this base, and they send out guys to plant churches. Then returning to the existing churches to encourage the believers. Once Paul reached Corinth, situated on the outer limit of the, the sphere of influence of Antioch, he desired to plant a new base, and so he stayed at Corinth for 18 months. Corinth never worked out as a base, and we're able to read of some of the problems with division and doctrine that the church had in 1 and 2 Corinthians. Clearly, Paul's heart was that the Corinthian church would grow up into maturity and overcome their problems. And so he tried to establish a base in Corinth, and it just didn't work. Corinth never became a base, even though it was a wealthy city and the church was not lacking in spiritual gifts. Paul then established a second base at Ephesus. Ephesus became a base where Paul trained leaders and once again created a model to multiply. Paul and his team influ uh, had an influence on the whole of Asia, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 16, planting churches and training leaders. From Ephesus, Paul and his team reached out a second time to Corinth. So he hadn't given up on his idea of creating Corinth as a base. They also reached out from the second base of Ephesus to Crete, Macedonia, Greece, Troas, Galatia, and possibly Rome. Paul's plan was to reach as far as Spain and to use Rome as a base for that. And so Paul's clear strategy is to work with team, training faithful men to train faithful men. He uses key cities with geographic, economic, and political influence to establish key bases that can influence the surrounding area by planting churches and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Paul uses business persons, he uses civic leaders, and religious leaders to help plant churches. Paul is based in a local church, but his ministry is translocal, and he's training others so that they can now hand over the ministry. Each local church has a sphere of influence through which it can impact and change. Each local church can extend this sphere of influence by sending out short-term and by sending out church planters, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a pattern of how God multiplied 
the work in the New Testament. And that pattern, central to that pattern, is establishing bases from which churches could be planted. And Paul was so successful that he's able to say the entire Asia, which is a massive region, has been impacted by the gospel. And so our story is as we started moving north through Africa, someone plotted the cities and the doors that had opened up to us, right up to Egypt. And the pattern was exactly the same as the pattern that we pick up in the New Testament. God gives us key cities along trade routes. And so there were maps that were drawn of um, the doors that God had opened to us, that this door led to that door, a base was established here, that base, and it was all along the trade routes, and the pattern was incredibly similar to that of the New Testament. And central to that was our understanding of base churches. And so the paradigm of what a base church was, was broken, and freedom came. And so as you go and establish your beachhead that God has called you to, it has to be with an understanding that we're part of something far greater, that this is just another little movement on that road, on those trade route roads, as the gospel spreads out into different countries and um, through the doors of opportunity that are opened up to us. And so we started receiving teaching and revelation on what it means to be a base church, what it means to start a church plant with the idea in mind that this is going to be a base church because this is God's ultimate plan for every single church that is planted. Um, We experienced that in the Eastern Cape, in the church that uh, I have the privilege of leading, where our resources suddenly became, we made available to the corporate effort that we were involved in. And we saw God's blessing. And we saw church planters rise um, you know, in our ranks. And we were able to send out. And in the end, in the Eastern Cape, uh, we had one or two churches. Um, and that grew to 25, 30 churches as people started planting into different areas and regions and little towns etc. But with an understanding that there's this bigger picture that we tied into, and that what we're doing is fundamental to the growth and the advance of the gospel. And so on an op- one opportunity that, I, that we had with Dudley, he sat and he kind of shared his heart around what he saw um, a base church was comprised of and, and what were some of the constituent elements around a base church. And I'm going to give his uh, <coughs> perspective on a base church, and then we're going to look at the example of the church at um, Ephesus. So there were, I think there's seven points, seven points that were of fundamental importance to Dudley as he began to open up the concept of base churches to us. And as we began to live in the reality of the um, experience of seeing this thing work in, in real life, the first thing he said was, a base church possesses New Testament, kingdom of God, values. That's where the journey starts. That's where we look at the biblical values, and um, there are many of them. Chris Vinant wrote an article where he set out 44, and I mean, I can let you guys have this, 44, we have no time this morning to work through all of this, 44 values, they're like plates. You know, you've seen those at at the circus, guys spin those plates and they keep them going. There are 44 that we've recorded here, but there are possibly more values, biblical New Testament values that we want to see operating in our churches. Um, So the first place where we start is by embracing biblical values for the operation of a church. It's where where God's will is expressed through His Word and through His ways. The second characteristic of a base church 
is that the church exists and lives for the sake of others. And this is so important to grasp right from the beginning, that the church exists and lives for the sake of others. It lives to fulfill the great commission and the discipling of all nations. And so this means that right from the beginning, we to make our people and our resources available to what God is doing in our corporateness. We make our finances, our equipment um, available where we begin to identify and raise up and train and equip those that carry the call of God to plant churches on their lives. And so this has to be fundamental into who we are and how we build that we exist for the sake of others. Thirdly, that the church that you are about to plant is able to sustain growth, maturity, and effectiveness even when you as the lead elder are away. So it's really important that from a very early stage you begin to develop large capacity people and a preaching pool that can carry the work when you away um, <clears throat> on apostolic activities, etc. And so it's important that we identify, that we train, and that we spend time and effort in raising up people, creating opportunities for folk to share and um, for folk to, for us to build that pool that we, we, we need to have that's so vital. We're very fortunate in the church that I'm part of at the moment that we've got a large, large pool of preachers that could quite adequately carry a, a service. And the challenge that we face is to create opportunities for people. Um, and God opens up those doors. So the third aspect of a base church is that it's able to sustain growth and maturity and effectiveness even when the lead guy is away. The fourth one is that a base church is a voice for truth and not an echo of our own culture. <clears throat> it's so important that we express the biblical values in a way that we don't mix them with our culture. And so, uh, I, was in, I was in Africa somewhere, and uh, I can't remember exactly who, but they explained the way that the missionaries brought the gospel to Africa in this way. They said they brought the gospel as a loaf of bread wrapped in plastic, and they gave us that to eat. And we ate the plastic, which is the culture, with the bread. So in other words, you will see, um, especially in the African context, guys walking around in a three-piece suit, in the blazing sun, shirt, tie, briefcase, and they brought the culture. <laughs> you know the story. They brought the culture with the gospel. And so we need to be very aware of putting a cultural slant on the gospel that we, that we, that we share with people. <clears throat> and not trying to mold people into our culture. So our dress, our worship style, um, wearing baseball caps in church. That was a huge issue for us. The youngsters started wearing their the older folks said, that's ungodly in the house of God. You don't wear a cap. And so we kind of tend to put our cultural rules on what we're wanting to build. And uh, we need to be aware of that. So are we a voice for truth and not an echo of our culture? You know where this is going to really catch us? <coughs> it's around gender issues, around same-sex marriage, around those kind of issues that we're gonna face with greater intensity into the future, that we don't become an echo of our culture, but rather we, we stand for truth. And so the fifth characteristics of a base church, according to Dudley, is it is constantly producing new leaders and church 
planters. Large capacity leaders attract large capacity potential leaders. And he kind of made this point. He said, allow for large capacity people to buck the system. It's an interesting concept. So very often we want everybody to toe the line and we paint very narrow lines for people to walk in and you get a big thinker, you get a large capacity person who comes along and just kind of messes around with, with, with the thing, uh, with, with your perfect little system. Um, and obviously there's the testing of heart and the testing of gifting and that. But uh, very often we stifle that which could be of huge value to us because we threaten maybe with someone that's got a large capacity, a greater understanding, a deeper revelation, and we suppress large capacity leaders. And sometimes we need to allow the system to be bucked every now and again. We need <coughs> divergent thought and creativity to open up areas of, of service and of ministry. And so a base church is one that is constantly producing new leaders and church planters. Number six, a base church is constantly planting new churches. And so one of the amazing things about Cornerstone is that there's this pipeline. That there's, you'll find people that are receiving the call, people that have been trained, people have been prepared, and people that have been released. And so there should always be a pipeline of preparation for church planters and for the folk that feel that there's a church in them somewhere, <clears throat> that we identify, that we fast track, that we spend time with, that we raise up uh, uh, church planters. And then number seven, a base church is where God alone gets the glory. And I can remember Dudley majoring on this where God alone gets the glory. So it's really important that God gets the glory and no one else. Not you, not your wife, not your children. God gets the glory. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> where people learn to speak well of him and not of you. So it's really very, very important. So those are some of the insights that um, Dudley had into a base church. One of the greatest examples, and we all should have a sermon in our pocket, and we all should be able to preach on base churches immediately and instantaneously, no matter where we go and what the circumstances are, because it should be kind of part of who we are. One of the best and the greatest examples is in Acts chapter 19. So if you've got your Bible there, I'm gonna show you a very, very easy way to understand what a base church is from Scripture in a way that you can teach it to yourself and you can teach it to other people and you can start with this Scripture as to how you're going to build a church. I've written these points in the margin and there are nine of them. They are repeated on page from page 204 You'll see them there, so if you do miss anything, the notes are there, and I'm just gonna go through them in my own kind of way as we look at them. So in Acts chapter 19 from verse one, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, where he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So the first thing that we do is we preach Jesus. And so he did a little analysis of these guys, uh, and he questioned them, and he found out exactly where they stood in their relationship with God. And he made sure that they had the full package. Um, <clears throat> our, all of us have a different journey in Christ. Some of us get the full package when we believe. Some of us, it's a longer journey. And so, 
We have to make sure when we're teaching and we're establishing people that there is repentance. You can't come to Christ without repentance. And it's very often in those prayers that we pray and people receive, um, and people come to the front and answer the prayer that the whole aspect of repentance is left out. And so repentance is important. It has to be established. Faith and trust in God has to be established. Um, baptism has to be, people have to be baptized as well. We can't just leave them. Baptism in the spirit has to be part of the package deal. And assurance of salvation has to be built in there somewhere. And so for me, my experience of coming to Christ, receiving Christ, uh, was one experience. I had another experience of assurance of salvation. I battled for a long time to know whether I was really saved or not. And so for me, the assurance of salvation was a different experience from that initial experience. Then there was the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which was another experience for me. Um, and, and, and then there was water baptism afterwards because I was in a church environment that uh, believed in infant baptism. So then the water baptism was another important experience for me. And so as we build, we preach Jesus and we preach Jesus with this full package. And so Paul wasn't afraid to question them and to find out where, where in this deal, what are they missing? And he was able to identify that and then lead them into a full salvation. And so a base church starts with preaching Jesus and the full package that's available to us. Um, my wife and I were part in the 80s, we were part of Hatfield just down the road when Ed Rabbit was still there. And um, in the evening services, there were baptism. Every Sunday evening there was a baptism service and there was like maybe 10 to 30 people that were baptized every Sunday night. And so you got to watch a lot of baptisms. And you got to understand, I got to understand that there's actually something really significant that's taking place. It's not just a, a, a water ceremony where people are getting wet and walking out the other side. And you would see people getting filled with the Spirit. They'd go into the water and they'd come up speaking in tongues, healed, restored. It was an incredibly powerful experience when you got to see so many of them over a, a, a number of years. And so we've got to lead our people, first of all, into the full experience of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And very often we assume so much, and very often people are missing essential characteristics of what it means to be a Christian. And so point number one there is we preach. It's a gospel-centered preaching about Jesus. The second point that we pick up from this base that Paul established is in verse eight. It says, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So I put a big number two there. That's the second characteristic. A base church preaches the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's the reign and the rule of God. And so the gospel's an introduction into the kingdom. That's the first step into the kingdom. But Paul began to preach about God, did systematic theology, looked at end times, looked at what this kingdom exists, where it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he began to preach the kingdom of God. That was his um, theme. And so a base church preaches the kingdom of God. It is a teaching center Truth, the truth of God's word was unpacked and um, opened up and revealed to everyone. Number three, a big number three in the margin is at uh, halfway through verse nine. It says, uh, so Paul left them, he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So he took disciples with him there was a process by which Paul made disciples. So a base church is a church that produces and develops intentionally disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a process of maturing that's established, that's direct, 
That's not haphazard, but there's a path that every single person is put on so that they mature in their uh, walk with Christ. So they made disciples, and you can pick up that up on the notes as well. Part of that discipleship involved action, involved sending folk out, and had a practical component. Big number four in the margin, next to verse 10. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. This was a sending church. They heard the word of God because they had people sent to them. Um, and so these were, this, was, this was a church that, as I say, sent people out. And they were able to say so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. Of God. It's an amazing, amazing witness that everyone heard the word of God as they sent out people. A big number five, and we need to move on quickly. A big number five is verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and the illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. So a base church is a church where there is supernatural activity. And I think the tendency as the church ages is to back off the supernatural. I think our culture makes it difficult for us to, to um, aggressively, confidently, boldly um, step out into the supernatural realm and to trust God for the power and the release and so right from the beginning, there were supernatural miracles, signs, and wonders. And those take faith, and they take stepping out of the boat and um, praying for folk, people in desperate circumstances and situations. And so it was a miracle kind of healing center, trust in God, expectation, anticipation, and they saw the miracles happen and take place. Then number six, in verse 17, towards the end of verse 17, it says, and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. In other words, this was a place where the name of the Lord was lifted up in worship and in praise. So a base church, central, fundamental to a base church is the center for praise and for worship. And we could develop these points uh, if we had more time. Number seven, verse 19, put a big seven next to verse 19. A number that practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. And so this was a church that impacted the society and the nature uh, and, and the people around them. Not only did it impact them with those scrolls, but further down in verse 23, we hear that there's a riot because of what Paul and them were preaching. In verse 26, it says, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia, etc. So the work of the church had an impact on the society and on the city where they were and even further afield. And so a base church is an impact center for the gospel. And then number eight, I'll mention that in verse 20, it's church planting. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And that was essentially through church planting. Then the last one uh, in verse 22, it says, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. And so Paul managed to raise up leadership um, through Timothy and Erastus, and he was able to send out the leaders to those different areas to help. And so we see from this verse 19 these wonderful characteristics of a base church that we are all called to establish and to build it's a church where Jesus is preached and the full ambit of salvation is explained. It is a church where the kingdom is taught, where disciples are made, where folk are sent out, where there are miraculous signs, wonders, and healings. 
where there's authentic worship lifted up to God, where the surrounding areas are impacted by the gospel, where churches are planted and leadership is raised up. And that kind of gives you a picture of the church that God is calling us to build as we establish based churches. So I trust that something of this settles in your heart and that this is what we are aiming for. To raise up a base church, it would be a resource for those outside of the four walls of our church. God bless. Got time's up. 